Um, so I guess uh, most of you have probably taken uh, Rob's Quantum Foundations course, but not all. So I'm not going to assume that you've taken that course. There will be a little bit of overlap. So a lot of you may be uh, see some say, may have seen some of the stuff before, but mostly it's it's different stuff. So quantum information. What is what is the idea of quantum information? What's it about? Um, so quantum information is is a field that's kind of built around the idea of thinking of quantum states in terms of uh, a new type of information. So regular classical information has certain properties. We can manipulate it in computers. We can you know, encrypt it using cryptography. We can uh, quantify it using the, the, the notion of information theory. Um, and in uh, quantum information, we try to, to understand how if you encode information in quantum states as opposed to just classical uh, substrate of some sort, then that, that information has different properties. And we'd like to understand what those different properties are, how we can manipulate them, and uh, in general, what you can do with quantum information. So one big part of the field of quantum information is building a quantum computer. The notion of a quantum computer then would be a computer that manipulates information that's encoded as quantum states. Um, but that's not the only thing we're interested in. First of all, of course, once we build a quantum computer, we'd like to know what we can do with it. Um, and uh, just in general, as I said, understand the properties of quantum information. Um, another side of the field of quantum information, though not one I'll really be talking about in this class, is, well, we have these insights we've gained about quantum information and thinking about quantum states as an informational thing. Can we apply that to understand physics better, understand computer science better, maybe learn some new things, even about class, the classical computer science world that, that we wouldn't have realized if we hadn't thought about quantum states? Um, so... Uh, to get started, so, so what's the basic idea? Well, um, so classically, we like to quantify information using bits. So a classical bit could be 0 or 1. And then a quantum bit or a qubit is a superposition. Alpha 0 plus beta 1 is the most general superposition. And we say that it's a bit, I mean a quantum bit, because it has a two-dimensional Hilbert space. Okay, And the two dimensions are, are indexed by the classical bit values. And then the, the fact that we can have superposition states like this, that's the new thing that quantum mechanics is bringing in. Um, but then, of course, it's, with just one bit and even just one qubit, there's a limited amount you can do that's, that's interesting. So uh, the real challenge and the, the real interesting thing comes in when we start to have many bits. So if you have um, n classical bits, then we have 2 to the n possible bit strings. 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 1, et cetera. OK? Um, and so then what's the, what's the quantum version of this? Well, it's n qubits, of course. And now, uh, as with the, the case of a single bit, the, the, the state of n qubits, the basis states of n qubits are going to be labeled by the classical states. So uh, that means that we're going to have uh, one basis state for each of these bit strings. So that's a 2 to the n dimensional Hilbert space. And then we can have superpositions of all of those 2 to the n dimensional, of all those 2 to the n basis states. So. Uh, Say it could something look something like this, sum over bit strings x. Of some amplitude 
and then the, the cat for the state. Okay? And of course, this includes lots and lots of states. And the fact that, that, that um, to, even to describe just a single one of these states requires 2 to the n complex numbers. Well, you know, with a normalization constraint. Um, so it's really kind of 2 to the n minus 1. But um, that, that means that there's, in some sense, a whole lot more information packed into, a, into a, a quantum state than there is in the classical state, where you can describe a single state using just n bits. To describe this quantum state, you need 2 to the n numbers, complex numbers at that. Okay? But of course, we can't access all that information. So this, it's, it's stored in a superposition. If we measure it, we'll just get one of these things at random. So if you think of it that way, it just seems like a, a random a probability distribution over classical bits. Um, but of course, you can take advantage of interference and superposition to do other things. So let's see. So um, so uh, of course, this, this set of possible n qubit states includes lots of interesting kinds of states. So some of them are just uh, tensor product states. So tensor product states, of course, can be written in a form something like this. Where you can separate out uh, uh, a straightforward pure state of the first qubit and a pure state of the second qubit. Um, but it also has entangled states. And so entangled states can be things like, here, let's skip the, so this is an example of an entangled state, uh, EPR pair, one of the four Bell states. You've probably seen it before. And this cannot be written in this form. Okay, and of course, you know, in the foundations course, you would have seen, um, maybe even in Adrian's course, that, uh, that, um, you can get you know, correlations that are stronger than, than you can any classical correlations and all sorts of interesting things that these entangled states could do. And so, of course, they're going to show up again in, in this course because um, the existence of entangled states is closely tied in with all the interesting properties and the interesting things you can do in quantum information. OK, um, so this is the states that we'll be dealing with. I won't uh, say too much about that right now, although tomorrow we'll, we'll get back to mixed states. Uh, but, but mostly, uh, quantum information is also about uh, what you can do with these states. Let's put it all the way up. OK. Um, so uh, when, we, when we want to do quantum states, we can transform them. using quantum gates. So, so gates are kind of the fundamental building block of a computation. So classically, when we think of, of, of writing a circuit as, a, as a, a, an algorithm, say, as a series of gates, each gate will be kind of the, the fundamental step in the computation. And it's working the same way in, in quantum mechanics. We say, We'll, we'll take some big quantum computation, we'll break it down into a series of, of small operations involving only a, a few qubits. Um, and each of those is going to be a quantum gate. Okay, and quantum gates, I, I should say that you can also think of a quantum gate as a, some big complicated thing involving many qubits. But usually we consider just the, the case where it's a small number. And um, quantum gates... are usually unitary. And the, the, the other options I'll discuss a little bit tomorrow. Um, but uh, let's start with the, the unitary gates. And so in particular, this means any unitary gate has an inverse. Okay, 
And so in particular, unitary gates are reversible. OK, so that's, that's something that's already a little bit different from what we normally think of in classical computation. So let's, um, let's go back to classical computation and uh, think about what it means to have reversible gates in classical computation. So um, if, you, if you just think about classical computation, you think about the fundamental building blocks that you'd like to do in a classical computation, um, well, you can, you can write them down as gates. And some of them, you'll find, are kind of naturally reversible. So for instance, a very easy example is the knot. So for knot, we can, we can write down a truth table. So we say we have. Uh, a bit that's going into the gate and a bit that's coming out of the gate. And the, the bit coming in could be either 0 or 1. And well, the not will reverse those. So if it came in as a 0, it goes out as a 1. And if it came in as a 1, it goes out as a 0. Okay. And if you prefer, you can think of this in terms of Boolean logic, where the variables are true-false instead of 0, 1. And in that case, uh, 1 might be true. And 0 would be false. OK? Um, and then there's some other gates where it's less obvious that they're reversible, but can still be made reversible without too much difficulty. So uh, an example of that is the, the XOR, or as, as it's somewhat more commonly known in the, the quantum information community, the, the controlled knot. for reasons that you'll see in a moment. Um, so the XOR, XOR stands for exclusive OR. Um, so writing that as the truth table, well, it's a two-bit operation. So going in, we have uh, two bits, A and B. And so there's four possible values for that, 0, 0, 0, 1, 1, 0, 1, 1. And then what the XOR does is it um, it takes basically the parity of these bits. So it says if they're the same or different. So it's the exclusive or. So one of them is one, but the other one is not. So uh, the output here should be a 0, because neither one is 1. The output here should also be 0, because they're both 1. And these two, the output is 1. OK? But if you look at this, you can immediately see that it's not reversible, as I've written it, because, um, well, because there's two things that give the output 0, and you don't know which one it was that went in. Okay, so there's no possible way to reverse it with just this information. Okay? But it's also not too hard to see that it can be made reversible by, instead of having a single output bit, we're going to have two output bits. And what we're going to do is we're going to keep the first output bit as the same as the first input bit. And then the second output bit will replace the second input bit and give us the XOR of the two bits. So if we do that, you see it becomes reversible. Because if we get the output 0, 0, well, we know the input was 0, 0. Now, if the, when the XOR was 0, there was another possibility, which was that the input was 1, 1. But in that case, the first bit would be 1. Okay? And going back, you see that, that all four of these output pairs of bits are different. And so therefore, we can deduce what the input is. And also looking at this truth table, you can, you can see the reason for the name controlled not, because the first bit stays the same, and the second bit gets flipped when the first bit was 1. Okay, So in other words, the second bit is getting a not done to it under control of the first bit. OK? So, um, so this is a kind of a, maybe the first non-trivial example 
of a classical reversible gate. I mean, the knot is non-trivial, but it's pretty simple. Um, and, but this is really a two-bit gate. It's interacting different bits. And you can start to plug them together to make sort of interesting circuits. But it's still kind of limited. It's not going to give you everything. Um, so, uh, well, OK, so before I go on, let me um, tell you about another way of, of writing these. So what we like to do when we uh, draw quantum circuits is not to write out these truth tables, which are kind of tedious. Um, of course, in quantum circuits, we're not going to write truth tables anyway. We're going to write unitaries. right? We're going to write them down as matrices. Um, but, but we like to instead draw what's called circuit diagrams. So for the knot, we'll draw a line and put a, a cross <laughs> circle in between it. So if you see that, which you very rarely will, actually, that means flip the bit as with a knot gate. Okay? And then for the, the XOR, the controlled knot, um, well, it's a two-bit gate. So we draw two lines. So each line. So each line is a bit in this case. And when, once we go into quantum circuits, there'll be two bits. Um, and then time goes from left to right. So for the control dot, we need two bits. And we put a, a small dark circle on, on the, the control bit, in this case, the, the first one. And then align, and then do the circled, uh, cir cross circle for the knot. So this is indicating that this bit is controlling the knot on this bit. So this one is, the first bit here is called the control bit, and the second one is the target bit. OK? And then you can start to put these together um, to, to make a circuit. And like I said, time will go from left to right. So for instance, if you have a circuit that <laughs> looks like this, this means do a controlled knot from the first bit to the second bit, and then do a controlled knot from the second bit to the third bit. OK? So any questions on this so far? Yeah? Um, about that classical bit. Isn't the definition something reverse of that and for round holes? I mean, isn't zero usually true? I mean, it doesn't matter. Um, I, I would say actually one is more common is true. It's, but, it's, but it's true. It's an arbitrary convention. Yeah. Uh, and for the gate, I'll show you next. I want to use this convention. I mean, it doesn't deeply, deeply matter, but. Uh, any other questions? Can you repeat, uh, what does this circle mean uh, when we have two lines entering? This one. Yes. OK, so this is the controlled knot gate. So, this, so, the, so you, you see the, circle, the cross circle is the same as this knot. And so it's this bit that's getting flipped, but it's getting flipped, flipped controlled on the first one. So if the first one is 0, we don't do anything. If the first one is 1, we do the knot gate on this one. So that's what this truth table is, is supposed to capture. OK? Any other questions? OK. So um, So OK, so now let's, uh, let's start to think about other gates. So the XOR, as I said, is not enough to, to get you any kind of classical circuit or any kind of classical function. Um, so another very simple uh, classical gate that you might think of is the AND gate. So the AND gate is, again, a two-bit gate. So there's four possible inputs. 
Um, and the AND gate is, is maybe easiest to understand using this interpretation of 0 as uh, false and 1 as true. Then the AND gate gives an output that's uh, true if both, the, if both of the input bits are true. Okay? So in particular, if both the input bits are 1, then the output is 1. And otherwise, the output is 0. Okay? So this seems certainly like a sensible classical gate. And actually, it turns out that, that classically, the AND gate and the NOT gate together are all that you need. You can do every, everything by putting those together if you want. OK, but it's also easy to see that this is not reversible, right? Because there's, <coughs> there's three zeros here. If, so if we got the one output, then we know the input was 1, 1. But if we get one of the zero outputs, well, there's three possibilities. So we can't reverse it. OK. So what well, we could try to do the same thing as we did for the XOR and say, well, OK, let's keep the first classical bit, the first uh, input bit around to, to help us. Um, but when we do that, we see it's still not enough. OK? Because, well, if we get the output 1, 1, certainly we know the, the input was 1, 1. If we get the output 1, 0, we know the input was 1, 0. But if we get the output 0, 0, we don't know if the input was 0, 0, or 0, 1. Okay, so we still lost some information in the process of this gate. Now, if you think about it a little bit, you'll see that, well, okay, suppose we didn't keep the first bit around. We kept some other function of a and b uh, in this place instead. Um, so is there something else that we could put in here that would, would let us make this reversible? No, because, well, there's only one extra bit of information that we can put in here. And there's three things that we have to disambiguate. Right? So there's no way we can completely specify which of these three things with only one bit. Okay? So keeping one extra bit, no matter what information we put there, that's not going to work. So the solution is to go up to a three-bit gate and to keep both input bits as well as the output bit. So this is called the Toffoli gate. <coughs> and so the way it works is now it's a three-bit gate. So we have three input bits and three output bits. Space down here. Okay. So, um, so now it's a little confusing, right? Because we, we intended to keep the two first input bits and then just put the answer in the third bit. But we have to, we have to take three input bits so that the third bit could start out in either 0 or 1. Um, so the solution, what we're going to do is uh, if the, input, this first in, the, the third input bit started at 0, then we'll put the and of the first two bits there. And if the third input bit started as 1, we're going to put the not of the, the first bits. Now, how is that going to help? Well, let's write down the truth table there. So, <laughs> so for these four, the and of a and b is, is sorry, for these uh, six, the and of a and b is 0. So then uh, the output bit will be the same as it started before, right? Because if the, if the output bit started as 0, we're putting in the AND, which is 0. If the, output, if the third bit started as 1, then the output will be the opposite of the AND, which is 1. Sorry. Yeah. OK. But in these two cases, the AND is 1. And so that means the output bit will be flipped. Okay. So what this Toffoli gate is calculating is it's taking the input A, B, C, and it's mapping it to A, B, C plus A times B. 
with plus is uh, the, the XOR, also the, just the binary arithmetic. OK? So since we're working with bits, we'll use binary arithmetic a lot. Of course, binary arithmetic is, is not very complicated. You have you know, 0 times anything is still 0. 1 times 1 is 1. Um, and of course, 1 plus 1 equals 0, as everyone knows. OK? So, uh, so, so this, you can see, is now a reversible gate. Because if you look at the output here, every one of these eight output strings is different. And that means that the output strings can uniquely determine the input strings. So it's a reversible gate. And in fact, just looking at it, you can see that the inverse of the Toffley gate is, again, the Toffley gate. Same thing was true for the controlled not gate. This doesn't have to be true for all reversible gates. It's easy to write down a reversible gate that doesn't have that property. But you know, these basic simple ones, in fact, are self-inverse. Okay? And then the circuit, uh, the notation for circuit diagram that we use for the Toffley gate is kind of a generalization of this controlled knot gate, because this is a controlled controlled knot. So the, the third bit gets, gets flipped, gets a knot, if and only if the first two bits are both 1. So we have two controls now and one bit flip. OK? So any questions on that? So anyway, the Toffley gate, uh, so the point of the Toffley gate is that it computes the AND, basically. So if you, if you put the third bit as an input of 0, then you can see that's all it's doing. It's computing the AND of A and B in the third place and just keeping the first two bits around for reference so that we'll be able to reverse it. Okay. Now, of course, it does something a little more interesting if, if the third bit is a variable. It could be 0, 1. But it's then more general than the AND. It computes the AND, and it does other things. Okay. And so it turns out the Toffley gate, and actually you don't really even need the NOT gate anymore, because the Toffley gate can also do the controlled NOT gate if you just put in a, a 1 for the first bit. This does the controlled NOT for the second and third bits. And the NOT gate, well, if you put a 1 and a 1 here, it does the NOT on the third bit. Okay, so it kind of generalizes all of these gates that I've written down. So it turns out, I'll, I'll mention this again tomorrow, but it turns out Toffley gate is enough. You can put Toffley gate and various uh, input bits together and get any, any classical function. Okay, um, so, so yeah, so that's the next step, is to try to put these things together and do something more interesting. So for instance, we can make a circuit to calculate uh, some the AND of three bits. So we have three bits. We want to calculate the AND of them. In binary arithmetic, that would be the product, A times B times C. OK? Um, so how do we do that? Well, um, we're going to use uh, the three input bits, but also some extra bits. Obviously, th these three input bits are not going to be enough, because we need to keep around an answer bit, at least, in order to make the whole thing reversible. Um, but, but we're really going to use two extra scratch bits, which both start in the state 0. So these extra bits are known as ancillas. Um, OK, so what are we going to do? Well, this, this kind of, the way it's written with the parentheses suggests that we should first take the AND of A and B. 
And so that's what the first scratch bit is going to do for us. So we'll do a Toffley gate from the first two bits to the first scratch bit. And so now at this point, this, this bit knows what the AND of A and B is. So we should take the AND of that and C. That means a Toffley gate from C and this <coughs> n syllabit to the other n syllabit. OK? And so then let's keep track of what we have at this point. Well, the first three bits haven't changed. They've only been used as controlled, as controls. This first n syllabit still has the AND of A and B here. It's A times B. And then this third bit, this, uh, sorry, second n syllabit, the last output bit here, is the AND of all three. It's the AND of A, B with C. And that's what we wanted. OK? But looking at the circuit, you can see that there's this extra scratch bit left over. We don't really care about that scratch bit. We don't want it there. Um, it's, it's, I mean, it's just junk, really. And when we go into to quantum circuits, it's going to be kind of harmful junk. Um, and, but you can certainly imagine that once you do a long circuit, well, each time you do a gate, you might have to add an extra, another scratch bit like this. And at the end of this long circuit, there's going to be a lot of these junk bits lying around. Okay? That's, that's messy. Um, and as I said, in the quantum case, it's actually bad, actually harmful, get in the way. Um, so let's think about how to remove those bits. Well, in this case, it's, it's relatively easy to do. Um, what we can do is we can take this circuit, and well, the first three bits are OK. We need to keep them around to, to make the thing reversible. And the last one is OK, because that has the answer. But this one, we'd like to get rid of AB. We'd like to, to return it to its original state. Well, how can we do that? Well, um, what we can do is we can do the inverse of this original calculation, this original Toffley gate, which is just the Toffley gate again. So think about that. When we do this, well, this bit gets flipped if and only if this bit, these bits are both 1. Okay. So um, in particular, using this formula, you can see this output bit. Well, at this point, it was a times b. And so then it goes to a times b plus a times b. Again, 1 plus 1 is 0, so this is 0. So getting us back where we started. OK, does everyone see how that works? So we can generalize this um, to an arbitrary circuit. by uh, uncomputing the, the first part of the circuit. So uh, suppose we have something that involves, I don't know, multiple input bits, a bunch of scratch bits, and we do some big circuit C. OK. And in this circuit, we have a bunch of bits that come out, but the answer says contained in this last bit here. So we'd like to make this whole thing, well, it's reversible, but what we'd like to do is we'd like to erase the scratch bits so that all we have left at the end is the, the original input, A, B, and the output bit that we're interested in. And the rest will all, all the other ancillas will be returned to their initial zero state. So how can we do that? Well, what we can do is we can add another ancilla which starts at 0. And we're going to, to take the output bit and copy it into this ancilla. Okay, this controlled not basically does a copy. right? Because if this is 0, this stays 0. Nothing happens to it. If this is 1, this bit gets flipped. So it becomes a 1 as well. Okay. Um, but we still have the junk around. And actually, we've made more junk because 
we, we copied the output bit. We only need one copy of it, really. Um, but now what we can do is we can do C inverse. C is reversible, so we know C inverse exists. And what C inverse will do is it'll take these output bits, which haven't changed as a result of this controlled knot, and it'll return them to their initial state. And here will be the function that we wanted to compute. Okay. So any questions on this? So anyway, the, um, this procedure, as you can see, is, uh, is maybe not perfect. Um, it, it requires, well, if, if C use, has um, N gates in it, then each gate might use you know, one ancilla bit. So you might end up using as many as n ancilla bits. And then you just restore them to their, to their initial state. Uh, it turns out there's more efficient things you can do. And you'll see one of them in the tutorial, kind of work out one of them in the tutorial today. Um, but uh, in terms of general efficiency, this is not too bad. Okay? The, the extra ancilla bits, the scratch bits you need, are just proportional to the number of gates that you want to do. And we'll get back to the notion of efficiency um, Friday or next week, I think. Um, but, but I just wanted to point that out. OK, so maybe that's enough for, for classical computation for now. It's not really why we're here. So let's go on to quantum gates. But I guess before I do that, I should make sure there's no questions on the classical reversible stuff. OK. So quantum gates. So quantum gates, we can make uh, any class reversible gate quantum by just putting cats around everything. So for instance, the knot will map uh, 0, ket 0 to ket 1, and ket 1 to ket 0. Um, but, but it's a quantum gate, so it should also act on superpositions. And quantum gates, well, they're in fact going to be unitary, but in particular they're going to be linear. And so that means if you have a linear superposition, of 0 and 1, that the, it has to act linearly on that. So uh, so in particular, alpha 0 plus beta 1 under naught is going to have to go to alpha 1 plus beta 0. OK? And similarly, the C naught. Well, it takes a, b, and it maps that to a, uh, a plus b, xor. OK? And so if you get a superposition again, which is now a superposition of two bits, that will get mapped to superposition. So C0 will leave these two strings alone, so they stay the same. And these two strings get flipped, so you see they get flipped in superposition as well. Okay, And of course, we can write these things as matrices. So, um, so the knot is a, a single qubit operation, so it's a 2 by 2 matrix. It's acting on a two-dimensional Hilbert space. 
And if you think about it for a few seconds, you'll see it's this matrix, sigma x, one of the poly matrices. And then C0 is a 4 by 4 matrix, and it looks like this with zeros elsewhere. Okay, You can see that this encapsulates what happens to the basis states. If you have a basis state 0, 0, so we normally, yeah, so 0, 0, 0, 1, 1, 0, 1, 1, and similarly the other axis. So if you have 0, 0, 0, 1, they get mapped to themselves, and 0, 1, uh, sorry, 1, 0, and 1, 1 get, get flipped. Okay? And then, of course, you also have the Toffley gate. That's another reversible gate. It's a valid quantum gate. And it takes cat ABC to ABC plus AB. And the matrix for that is going to be an 8 by 8 thing. Let's see if I can write it out. Um, what it does is it takes the first six. Uh, Oh, I made too much space. Okay, the first six basis states to themselves, and then uh, seventh and eighth get flipped. So it's again a zero, one, one, zero here. And then you have zeros elsewhere. Sorry, maybe there's some of you that can't see this bottom corner, which is the interesting one. But hopefully you can figure it out. I, I'm going to, the boards are going to move up in a second. Yeah. Maybe I'll do it now. Okay, now you can see it. Okay, so everyone happy with these gates? But of course, if you only use these gates, well, you can't do anything more than you can do classically. Right? If you start with a basis state, you'll still only have basis states by applying these gates. And well, this is quantum mechanics. We want to use superpositions. So we need some gates that do something interesting to superpositions, that create superpositions, that do interference between uh, different branches of superposition, things like that. Um, and so let's, let's introduce a few of those. Uh, so one of them, a very common one, is called the Hadamard rotation. So the Hadamard, I'll usually write as H. And it has a, a, it's a single qubit gate, so it has a 2 by 2 matrix. And that 2 by 2 matrix looks like this. Okay. So what does that mean in terms of the basis states? Well, it means that 0 will become 1 over root 2, 0 plus 1. And 1 becomes... 1 over root 2, 0 minus 1. OK? So that's a superposition. And if we start out with the basis state, we can use the Hadamard to get an equally balanced superposition of 0 and 1. Of course, you can do other single qubit rotations. You're not restricted to, to just this particular one. So you can also get things like, well, more generally, alpha 0 plus beta 1 using an appropriate gate. Um, so another interesting thing to do is a, a phase gate, single qubit phase rotation. I'll write that as R theta. And for complicated reasons, I'll define it this way. So in other words, it takes 0. Well, if you have a superposition alpha 0 plus beta 1, that will get mapped to alpha, alpha e to the minus i theta 0 plus beta e to the i theta 1. OK. Now, of course, in quantum mechanics, global phase has no significance at all. It's just a kind of notational thing, um, which means that this thing is really more or less equivalent to this matrix. Where we do a, a phase rotation by 2 theta on 1 and leave 0 alone. 
Okay? And that's because this state is the same as a global phase, e to the i theta, minus i theta, times alpha 0 plus beta e to 2 i theta 1. OK? Um, let's see. And so we can also draw uh, circuits that include the Hadamard and phase rotation. And they're just single qubit gates, so we only need one line. And so the Hadamard looks like this. We have the single line. We, we put a box with the, the, the H in it. The phase rotation looks similarly. And in general, if you have a one qubit, a kind of an arbitrary one qubit gate, or a two qubit gate, or a three qubit gate, we like to put a box and put the name of the gate inside the box. So that's kind of the generic thing. And I, I guess I already kind of used that notation up on the top blackboard there when I was talking about the general classical circuit and uncomputing the general classical circuit. Okay. So here's a variety of unitary gates. Um, it's, uh, there's, of course, lots of other 2 by 2 matrices we could write down, or 4 by 4 matrices, or 8 by 8 matrices. Um, and those are possible gates, too. Um, but these are kind of a nice set to work with. So before I go on, does anyone have any questions on, on these quantum gates? OK? So um, then, of course, we need something more than just uh, unitary gates. Because, well, we've done this computation. And at the end of the day, well, we've transformed one quantum state to another quantum state. But unfortunately, we're classical objects. And so we'd like to know the answer to our computation. To do that, we need a measurement. And of course, I'm sure in, in Rob's foundation class, you talked a lot about measurements. Um, mostly, I'm just going to take it as a given. And the measurement does this. Well, first of all, I guess I should say how to draw it. So I will draw measurements probably just like this, um, maybe with some additional notation to indicate what I'm measuring. Um, but let's just imagine measurement in a standard basis. The standard base is also sometimes called the computational basis or the Z basis. Um, and what I mean is I'm measuring whether that bit is 0 or 1. Okay? And of course, you, you know how that works, but let me be uh, explicit. So generally, we might be measuring this bit, and there's other qubits in the computer that we're not measuring. So in general, we might have a state that looks something like this, alpha 0, psi 0, plus beta 1, psi 1. Okay? And what we get is, well, with probability alpha squared, we get outcome 0. And the residual state is psi 0. And with probability beta squared, we get the outcome 1, and the residual state is psi 1. Help you see that a little bit. OK? OK, so any questions on this? OK, so um, of course, once we have these gates, the whole point is to put them together to do interesting things. OK, and so for instance, we have certainly have enough gates that will let us do interesting things. So. For instance, we 
we can make an EPR pair. So how do we do that? Well, let's, it's a two qubit thing. So we'll start out with two qubits, both in state zero. And well, we need a superposition here, right? We want to create the state zero, zero, plus one, one. So uh, let's make a superposition using the Hadamard. So now this qubit is zero plus one. So of course, there could be normalization there, one over root two, zero plus one. But the normalization is automatic. Right, you know it's always normalized, so I'll frequently ignore that normalization. Um, and then we have to somehow get a correlation between these two qubits. Um, and so what can we do? We can do the controlled not gate. Controlled not gate will flip the second qubit if the first qubit is one. And so that means that when this is 0, this stays 0. And when this is 1, this gets flipped to 1. And so what that means is the output state is, is what we wanted, 0, 0, plus 1, 1. So you see that even though this gate is a classical gate, because we're doing it on a, as a superposition state for the first qubit, the output, bit, the output state Sorry, this gate was a classical gate, then, and the, the, the thing here was a tensor product state, but the output is an entangled state. Okay? So this gives you a sense of, of what kind of interesting things can happen when we start to put the, the, the more quantum gates together with the classical gates. Okay? Um, and of course, you can put together more gates and get more interesting circuits, and we'll talk about that through, well, most of the rest of the class. Um, but uh, let me just make one more point today. So, uh, so I told you that um, this business of, of uncomputing was going to be important in the quantum case, and I want to just give you some sense of why that's true. So um, in the classical case, we wanted to get rid of the scratch bits just because they were kind of messy. But in the quantum case, we're going to want to do interference between different branches. And to do that, we're really going to have to erase any extraneous information, because extra information can collapse the superposition when you're ignoring it. So, uh, so for example, let's suppose we wanted to, to calculate this, this same thing, A and B. Uh, and C, but we want to do it on a superposition. We've already seen that, that uh, doing a classical gate like control not on a superposition can give us an entangled state. So let's do this particular classical circuit on a superposition. Um, so let's imagine, say, the superposition uh, 0, 0, 0 plus uh, 1, 1, 0. So this is uh, an entangled superposition already. But, and then the scratch bits, of course, start out as 0, 0. Okay. So let's do it, try imagining doing it the two ways. One, where we keep the scratch bit around. That's, uh, oh, that's behind. So one where we keep the scratch bit around and one where we erase the scratch bit. And you'll see that they're actually different states. OK, so, um, so with scratch bits, well, this becomes uh, we have 0, 0, 0 for the, the first three bits are not going to change. But, um, the, uh, the, the, in this case, the, the extra scratch bit is 0 because it's the and of the first two bits. And the, the output is also 0. So we get 0, 0 for the other two bits. But then the case where we have 1, 1, 0, well, the and of the first two bits is 1. And the output is also 1. Yeah, 
Okay. Um, so that's the case where we have scratch bits. Now let's look at the case where uh, we've uncomputed scratch bits. Yeah. Why do we have last two um, uh, Oh, you're right. Yeah, OK, that's what I was doing wrong. You're absolutely right. So the, so the output is 0 there, because the end of all three of these is 0. Should pay more attention to my notes, I guess. Um, OK, so, uh, so let's take the case that we'll be uncomputed. The scratch bit. So when we uncompute the scratch bit, well, this is still the same. But in this case, this scratch bit has been changed back to zero. Okay. So, um, so uh, in both cases, we're probably interested in this last bit because it was the answer to the, the computation word. But we're not really interested in the fourth bit. So what happens here when we, we trace out the scratch bit, that's where you see the difference. So in this case, tracing out the scratch bit, well, it doesn't disturb very much, because we've, uh, it, we've, we've said it to always be 0. So in this case, we have the superposition. Uh, well, the first two bits will be 0, 0, plus 1, 1 in an entangled state. And then we have 0 and 0 for the original third and fifth bits. And in the case where we, we, we didn't uncompute, we have something different. Because now the fourth bit is different in these two cases, orthogonal. Right? So instead of getting a superposition of those two cases, we're going to get a mixture. So half the time. We get uh, 0, 0, 0, 0. And half the time, we get uh, 1, 1, 0, 0. Okay? So these are different states. This is a mixture, this is a superposition. So this state, for example, exhibits you know, uh, non local correlations, this one doesn't. And there's, you know, as we look at more, more sophisticated circuits, there'll be cases where, you know, this thing can give you the answer to the computation you're interested in, and this one can't. Okay? So that's why, classically, uncomputing is just kind of neat, but it's not really essential. But when you're doing a quantum circuit, uncomputing is really important. You must do it, or you won't get the right answer. Okay, um, so that's enough for today. Uh, so tomorrow we'll talk about um, whether you know these unitary gates are really enough. What unitary gates you need to be able to do an arbitrary quantum computation. So there are questions on today. Can we do all of these gates in the lab? Can we do them all in the lab? Um, well, I can't because I'm not uh, much of an experimentalist. Um, so it depends. So there's a lot of different systems. I'll be talking later this week about, about some of the different systems people have, have thought of for building quantum computing. Um, and in the more advanced ones, yes, we can do all the gates I've showed you today uh, in the lab. There's some other, some other systems where um, they can do some of these gates, but for instance, maybe they can't even have three viable qubits at the same time. So doing the Toffoli gate would be kind of hard. Um, and uh, of course, in the, in the real lab, they don't perform exactly these gates, but they do something kind of close to them. And so it's a question of, of how close they can get. Any other questions? Yeah. What is the mixture of the uncomputed? So it's a mixture of, so there's four bits, right? And it's a mixture of this part with this part. So the four bits that, we've, that are left over are, are, are either all zero, or they're one, one, zero, zero. OK, so this is a density matrix notation. You saw this in Adrian's class, right? Uh, 
I think she was asking about the just lower one. Uh, no. This one? Oh, this one. Oh, this one's not a mixture. So this one, oh, so, uh, yeah, so this is a pure state. If you write it this way, if you write it as a density matrix, well, it'll just, I mean, if you write this one as a density matrix, it'll, it'll, it'll have these off-diagonal terms. So, um, so this part as a density matrix is uh, 0, 0, let's see, 0. And then we also have uh, the, the off-diagonal term that looks like this. Another off-diagonal term. And then another diagonal term. Okay. So you see, these, these are the extra terms. OK? Any other questions? OK, then see you tomorrow.